Welcome to Emergency First. We're so glad you're here. Thanks for watching this week's message. If you would like more information about Marinci First, such as service times or ministry opportunities, feel free to check out facebook.com backslash Marinci AG or Marinci First at youtube.com. And two great ways to stay connected throughout the week is by hitting the subscribe button on our YouTube page. That way you'll be notified when something new is posted and by hitting like on our Facebook page. Thanks again for joining us today. Welcome home. How many of you believe that anything can happen in this place? More than a song, the Jesus that we serve is alive and He's present. He's living in us. He's working among us by His Spirit. And uh, I think it's time for us to receive from Him and feast from His table. They don't call Him the bread of life for nothing. Sorry, sorry keto people, right? But uh, He is here to feed us, to help us, to strengthen us. And I am so grateful that God would put His Spirit to live in people like me and you, people with problems. Anybody stand by somebody with problems, right? And uh, that God would come and He'd work His mercy and His goodness in us. The Apostle Paul told the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2, uh, he, chapter 1, he told them, think of what you were, who you were when God called you. And he basically goes on to say, the reason that, that God extended His love to you wasn't because any of us were great. But instead, he chose the upside down, the people with needs and the people with brokenness and the people incomplete in some level, without wisdom, without strength. Why? So when he works in us, we can say, that's God at work, not me, right? And I'm so thankful that, that by humbling ourselves before the Lord, we experience the treasure of heaven in our lives. God, thank you so much that you would put treasure on earth in vessels. And I ask you, Sovereign Lord, would you grant your favor upon this room and those watching online tonight that it would be the easiest place in heaven or earth for people to receive from you? I pray, God, that even during the teaching time, people would just be getting healed of all manners of illness and disease and struggles and injuries and even emotional pain. And God, that you would come tonight and minister by your grace. Touch us with your power, we pray. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. You can be seated if you like. Worship team, thank you so much. You guys are absolutely amazing. And uh, wow, fantastic, fantastic. Well, it goes by quick, doesn't it? And um, I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is we're leaving, and you're probably sick of us. The bad news is for you, we're taking the Holy Spirit with us. I'm sorry. How many were taking the Holy Spirit with you when you go to, right? Yeah. But, um, but he, he lives inside of us, and he's there to help us and to minister his grace to us. And uh, it's been such a joy for Rochelle and I to get to meet so many of you, and, and it's been a special joy to, to get to meet the Lanes in person and really spend more time with him. God's blessed you guys with great leaders in this house. Wow. And the whole pastoral staff. I mean, just amazing. And everyone, I mean... I had my hand shaken off every time on the way through, my, you know, and uh, uh, the door. You can't get into this church without feeling welcome and, and friendly, and it's authentic and legitimate, and man, it's just amazing, and, and we're so grateful for your kindness. I hope you'll pray for us. Uh, even if you don't like us, pray for us. It will build your character or whatever, but um, pray for us this next week. We're in Austin, Texas, and then we're in Oklahoma. And then we go somewhere else. I don't know. It's always somewhere else. I try not to think more than a couple of weeks ahead. Within a normal calendar year, we typically do um, uh, 200 and change uh, services, about 250 to 275 services a year. And so um, it keeps, keeps busy, and, but I hope you'll keep us in prayer and particularly pray for our overseas uh, things. We had just this past week, we had a little bit of a uh, kind of a hiccup. I think, I think it's resolved, but to keep us in prayer for our ministry in Asia, in Korea, and in Japan. Apparently, going for, we're only in Korea five days before we go to Japan, and Japan doesn't like that. They want you two weeks somewhere before you come in. And so, but there's some kind of a... I don't know, we get extra COVID test or something like that in Korea, and then when we land on the ground. Anyway, you just pray with us that God will work all the details. He always does. You know, it's always little things, but no big deal. I mean, people are facing major things, and I'm whining about an extra COVID test. But, but, um, but keep us in prayer, if you would. We really deeply appreciate that. And then if you're interested, there's um, books and other stuff back there that will be a blessing. I didn't mention, um, I f keep on forgetting to give stuff away, too. Maybe I'll do that now. Um, all right. People always ask, what is the newest book? It's this one, Goodbye Chicken, Hello Dove. And how many, some of you have read this already, right? 
Um, so this is super helpful, especially for people that have um, already encountered the Holy Spirit's power and they just want to uh, go deeper and understand how to put it to work. So, brother, even though you're wearing cowboy stuff, it's for you, all right? I'm, I'm a bitter Eagles fan, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, yeah, yeah. Um, although I did, I told Pastor, you know, being raised outside of Philly, you know, Cowboys are kind of not your favorite team. And, uh, but when I was seven years old, way back when, Tom Landry, who was a great believer, he came through and he preached one of our men's conferences uh, for several of the Assemblies of God districts on the East Coast came together. And I, was like, I have his autograph on a pennant in a drawer hidden away in my office still from seven years old. Don't tell anyone, especially Jesus. Shh. All right. Um, but uh, there, there's a book back there if you're interested in becoming more proficient in praying with other people to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, helping others receive the gift. Book for you guys. Do you have this one already? There you go. Merry Christmas. All right. And notice that is in eagle's colors. It is. All right. So um, then we have, um, we have uh, anybody speak the language of heaven here? Uh, all right. You already have this? Do you have one of these or no? No. You don't have an Espanol. Okay, all right. So um, you guys have one of these in English? You have one? Do you have one? You have one? There you go. Okay. Here you go. You can fight over these. How's that? All right. You can share. That one, by the way, that ugly book right there, um, don't let the cover. It's really ugly. I didn't design it. Let, let um, That book called Divine Order is all about how the gifts of the Holy Spirit flow in the local church. If you've ever wondered, like, how people should flow and when you know, I think someone's going to prophesy or something. That's all, what that book is all about. So anyway, really helpful. Take advantage of those. If we ran out of anything, I apologize. It's hard kind of flying in and kind of guessing what to bring. And if we ran out of anything, Rochelle can hook you up and you can always get it online. Plus on our website, there's all kinds of free stuff on there too. Um, there's audio, there's video, there's even want to download and print if, that, if you need it on paper. All that stuff's available. So take advantage of it. All right, let's dive in. Uh, so we're going to teach a little bit, and then we're going to go to a season of prayer. We're going to have um, two things going on at the same time. How many of you can multitask? Well, you're doing it right now. You're sitting there and staring at me, right? Okay. And then probably digesting as well, right? And uh, making a shopping list at the same time. And so... Um, at the end of the service, we're going to do a little multitasking because God is great and he has limitless processing power. So we're going to give him the opportunity to do two things. We're going to have um, healing prayer taking place. Now, a lot of times people think about healing prayer. Oh, well, you know, it's not that bad. I manage, you know, it only hurts when I play tennis and whatever, and I'm okay. But why not give God the opportunity to heal it? I found the more you invite Jesus to your life circumstances, the more he shows up. But there are probably some needs in this room that are critical, and God forbid, even terminal diagnoses. And we, we thank God for medical care. How many are thankful for great medical care? God uses that, no doubt. And, and we pray extra grace on those that are used in healthcare community. You have a really uh, fascinating um, and, and uh, designed by God inroads to minister to people. And we're so thankful for all. There's no conflict between God's power and medicine. As a matter of fact, they work hand in hand. But a lot of uh, folks maybe are, are struggling with, maybe you're in the middle before, you know, you're in some mysterious illness kind of waiting for the diagnosis to come and you're kind of living in limbo and that can in of itself add extra layers of stress and, and or, or maybe God forbid you're having a real critical diagnosis. We believe that Jesus is here to minister to your needs. He's here to help. He loves and he's concerned about us. And out of curiosity, how many of you have ever received a healing touch in your body from the Lord? Hold up a hand real high, wave it around, look around. That's every section, multiple hands, and we are so grateful for God's touch, and we're going to give him the opportunity to do that. So I challenge you, even if you go, well, I'm pretty good, I'm just, you know, I just could use a little Botox or whatever, um, you know, but um, if you give God that opportunity, even if it's something small, even if you're like, you have seasonal allergies and it's not bugging you now, receive prayer, uh, let God work in that way. We will have that healing prayer will take place in the seating area where you're at, all right? We will have anyone that says, hey, I want to be baptized in the spirit. I'm somewhere in that process, but I haven't yet fully received to the point where I've had that confirming sign of that supernatural language we've talked about. If you want that to happen, uh, come forward at the end of the service and I'll invite you to come forward and some uh, pastors and myself, we'd love to pray with you and Jesus will baptize you in the spirit. And usually, even if you've been praying last night or last week and last night and this morning and the new language hasn't happened for you. That's no problem at all. It always comes. You just have to give it some time. 
and it's kind of just letting some process take place. You've got to let the dough rise a little bit, you know. And uh, so very often it's this service, this last service, when all those that have been seeking uh, receive in that full way. But if you've been seeking and the new language hasn't come yet, stop and think you probably have had a heightened awareness of God. You're experiencing his power and his grace, so you're walking in this, and it's a very, very, very good thing. How many want to stay receiving all the days of your life? You know, surefire way to lose your TV signal is to take your dish down, and, uh, but, but keep your receiver on and receive from him all the days of our lives. All right, so uh, we want to read three scriptures together. The first scripture we're going to read is the story of this dude named Bartimaeus, and so the, pre- the prefix in Hebrew, bar, doesn't mean place to get drunk. It means son of, you know, Beth means house of, Bethlehem, house of lamb, um, bar Timaeus. Timaeus is the Hebrew version of my name, Tim. And I know we have some other godly Tims in this room, right? So um, the son of Timaeus or son of Tim, Tim's son, because it was back in the days when they didn't use surnames like we use. And so they would either locate you and, and determine which Tim you were by where you were from, Tim from Morency, you know, or uh, they would locate you by your parents' names. And so they would go, uh, you know, like even today, we like I've encountered uh, your uh, executive presbyter, Sorensen, right? So that's kind of what uh, Scandinavian, Norwegian or something like that, but ends with son because that's kind of how surnames came about. So this is before all that. We're going to read about Bar Timaeus, Tim's son born blind and see the healing that took place in his life. And then we're going to go and we're going to hop ahead into the book of James. And we're going to take a look at James, the half brother of Jesus, not one of the original disciples, but later the pastor of the Jerusalem church throughout the book of Acts uh, from about Acts 13 onward. And we're going to read how James wrote to the church what our response to sickness should be. It's a good thing. And then finally, we're going to read a little portion out of the book of Revelation. We've got to end up in heaven. All theology, all stuff about God, all problems and all uh, things begin in the book of Genesis. And they're all resolved in the book of Revelation, the end of Revelation and the end times. And so we're going to see how when we're with the Lord forever, how this all wraps up. And I think will give us perspective. So why don't you stand with me to your feet in honor of the reading of God's word. And let's dive in and take a look at that first scripture slide if we can. And thanks again to the amazing media team. You guys are awesome. You have been like on triple duty this weekend. And we are so thankful for you. Um, okay, so here we go. Then they reached Jericho. And as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him, but he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. So they called the blind man, Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go, for your faith has healed you. Instantly, the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. Now from James... Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be forgiven. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Now hop in your time machines and let's go to heaven for a moment. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain, 
All these things are gone forever. The angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit with a fresh crop each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. No longer will there be a curse upon anything for the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there, and his servants will worship him, and they will see his face. Father, thank you that you have not only grace and help for us right now, but you've got it all worked out in the end, perfect wholeness for each one of us eternally. Thank you, God, that you would love us so much that you not only make all things right in the end, but you'd help us until then. And I pray, gracious Jesus, that you would help each one of us to remove maybe the trigonometry thinking we have about how to receive from you. We've got to do this and that and the other thing. And, and instead, just help us to focus our eyes on you and humble ourselves and draw near. Just get underneath your waterfalls and let your grace and power pour over our lives. I pray, Lord, tonight that you would perform miraculous physical emotional recovery in people's lives tonight that literally changes the way they live. I mean, turns things around. Thank you for it, God. Minister your grace tonight. Marinate us right now, I pray. Thank you, Lord. Amen, amen, amen. You can be seated if you like. Can we go back to the first scripture slide, please? And let's look at Bartimaeus for a moment. Probably the majority of what I'm gonna do tonight is just work through the scripture. Is it okay if we read the Bible in church? Is that all right? Okay, so... Uh, <laughs> So they reached Jericho. So if you know your geography, Jericho is the closest city to the Dead Sea. You familiar with the Dead Sea? Anybody been to Israel, by the way? So did you float in the Dead Sea? I didn't do it either. I, I looked at it and said, eh, everyone's smearing themselves with the mud and hopping in the water. I'm like, eh. That's like borderline caustic water. And for real, it is. It's the highest concentration of salt in any natural occurring body of water. And uh, you just, like, you can't sink no matter what, you know. Uh, which is good if you're not that strong of a swimmer. But people smear themselves with mud on the edge of the water, and they hop in there and float around in everybody else's mud, dirt, water. It's like the hot tub at a hotel. You know, you're like, I, no thank you. Um, it's like, I'm, if I'm going to marinate in germs, I, you know, could find another way to do it. But um, Jericho is the city. It's, you know, it's the city from the Old Testament. Um, the walls came a-tumbling down. Joshua, the whole business, of course, it was rebuilt later on. And still a little bit of a, it's more of a truck stop and a fuel station right now. The city of palms, uh, palm trees. It's kind of an oasis in this desert. But the main deal about Jericho and the Dead Sea is its low elevation. So it is the, um, uh, the Dead Sea in Jericho is the lowest inhabited elevation above ground that's not underwater. So it's, a, it's a low, it's a basin. And uh, there's only a few basin lakes. There's Devil's Lake in um, North Dakota, and then there's the one in Russia, the Dead Sea. These are basins. They have no way for the water to get out by, but evaporation. So there's a lot going on here. Just so they reach Jericho, Jesus and his disciples leave town. A large cr crowd is following him. And this is already, we're into Mark 10 now. So um, this is, you know, the, the passion of Christ starts uh, what Mark, the end of Mark 13. So it's towards the end of his ministry. So Jesus has already done all this stuff. Everybody kind of knows about him. The noise is abroad. Everybody's tweeting about him, right? And so they leave town. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus was sitting beside the road. So in this era, you are now, um, Israel is under the rule of the Roman Caesars. Um, after the conquest of Alexander the Great and all that stuff, they kind of know what it's like to be tromped on by everybody else and the Medo-Persians and everybody. So now they're under the rule of Rome, and there's this tension there. Rome was a lot smarter uh, than some of the other groups. Rome allowed some of the Jewish leadership to remain in place because they realized they could quell rebellions if they just kept some of the pieces of normal society in place, and then they could tax that, um, that group. And so they had the priesthood and the religion in place. But that was subservient to Rome. And then they also uh, kind of brought up uh, a new dynasty of kings that had kind of happened 
in the intertestamental period they call the Hasmonean house and so that's where you get the Herods from the King Herods and there's several of those and so they had that in place but the Herods were really figurehead only they could live in a palace and drive a Rolls Royce and have all the perks but they had to keep the people from revolting so they knew at the end of the day Herod could you know get a, a text message from Rome and he was over but he knew that so there's all these political tensions going on during this time the ruling government uh, of Rome didn't really care about the sick or needy in, in the places where they ruled. So they kind of left it up to the goodwill of the people who lived there to take care of those in need. If you were blind in that day or you had some other um, a physical issue that kept you from working a full day's wage, you were considered, and this is terrible, but you were considered less than someone that could work a full day's wage. Now, we all know that's unrighteous, but you're not dealing with righteous leadership here, you know? And so there was no social security, there was no safety net, and so they would appeal to people who had a heart inclined towards God. So they would position themselves either in transit routes or on the way in and out of, a, out of the temple or a synagogue, and they would wait for like the Sabbath when people would go to worship, and they would sit there and wait, and they would ask for alms. There are three types of biblical giving. There's the tithe, which is 10%. But how many know it all belongs to God anyway? And it's a lot easier to live off 90% that's blessed of the Lord than 100% that's cursed. Have you found that to be true? It's crazy how it works. Um, if you haven't yet, I dare you to try it out. The Bible actually, Jesus, or God says in Malachi, test me on this. So you can, there's like a, a money back guarantee sort of on that. But um, the tithe, the tenth, and then there's the offering. That's an above and beyond. So you know, you have a missionary come in and go, hey, we're going to reach the unreached people of Tatooine, you know, help us. We're going to, those Tuscan people are a tough, tough bunch. Help us, send us, you know, and so you, an additional offering, you go and you, you know, you support that or a church is doing a project or something like that, an additional giving. And then the third type of biblical giving, the tithe, the offering, and the alms. The alms is to take care of the needs of people. And so we, you know, you do compassionate giving. We, uh, you know, most churches have some kind of giving towards, you know, even foster care or some, all kinds of stuff like that and needs of people around the holidays, whatever, you know, whatever the need might be, food bank or, you know, different ways and different churches do it different ways. But so this is alms giving. So Bartimaeus is sitting beside the road, a very normal thing. If you're a beggar in those days, you are way below poverty level. You have very limited resources, and you typically are living as less than a servant in the house of a relative. So this is Bartimaeus, lowest social standing. Um, you know, kind of people are just kind of like out of pity, giving them, you know, here and there a pittance. So if we go back to that scripture real quick. So Bartimaeus sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of what? Nazareth. Now, what is Nazareth? Anybody know? It's a place. It's a city in the Galilee. So there were five provinces of Roman Palestine, Roman Israel. The Galilee was the northern province. It was all about fishing and agriculture. It actually honestly looks, a, part of it looks a lot like this area here, kind of rocky rolling hills and mountains and things like that. And then there was also a lot of grassy areas and, and some farming and stuff like that going on. And, and so Nazareth was uh, uh, one of the main cities of the Galilee. Jerusalem was in the province of Judea, and that's where Jericho was and Bethany and so many of these other places. It was a little more inhabited, a little more international. But the Galilee was kind of like an agriculture, farming, you know, good people. Like, basically, if the zombie apocalypse happened and you were in Jerusalem, you were going to die because they were all like stockbrokers and, and car salesmen, right? And how many know a stockbroker can't help you in the zombie apocalypse? But a farmer can, because a farmer can do anything with duct tape and bailing wire. I mean, they are the MacGyver of society, right? And so that's kind of the way this was. So um, Bartimaeus sitting beside the road, and he sees Jesus of Nazareth. Again, look at that text. The text says Bartimaeus heard. What did he hear? People saying, hey, Jesus of Nazareth. That was what he was known, because it's the Jesus, or Joshua would be the you know, the Hebrew pronunciation of his name, the Lord who saves, um, of Nazareth, the one who's from Nazareth. Now, this is a big deal because was Jesus born in Nazareth? Anybody remember where Jesus was born in? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. 
But then after the persecution of Herod the Great, where he killed all the children because he wanted to kill the king of the Jews, the Magi saw the star and all that stuff, they fled to where? Egypt. They were there for a couple of years, and then they came back and settled in Nazareth uh, for specific reasons. And so when they're there in Nazareth, um, this is the association of Jesus. People basically didn't know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. They just knew he was the Jesus, the Joshua from Nazareth that's healing people. So when Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus of Nazareth, have mercy on me. Son of David. Remember, before surnames, you were known by your first name and then either where you were from or who's your daddy, right? Okay? So Jesus of Nazareth, he was nearby. Bartimaeus said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now, if you've not read uh, very deep in the Bible yet, this may not jump out to you, but what's going on here? is in the time between the Old Testament and the New Testament when everything was an all-time low. That's Alexander the Great killing everybody and sweeping through and taking over and then the uh, Romanization of his empire and all. I mean, it's, it's a mess. It's a bad time to live. I mean, you think it's bad now or any other time. It was worse then, right? And so you come home and your home's owned by somebody else you know, when you come home from work. I mean, that's kind of the way it was. And probably most everything you have is gone and Many of the people you love are killed. I mean, it's, it's, it's bad times. During this time, as often throughout Jewish history, whenever they came to an all-time low, it was typically associated with their own turning away from God, right? Remember this? And so um, what happens when they hit the all-time low, they began to look up again. And they began to say, God have mercy. During the time between the Testaments, this intertestamental period, the, the leaders, the priests and the scribes who, who recorded, because not everybody could read or write, they would make copies of the scriptures, a very specific protocol they would follow, and the leaders and all this stuff. They began to go, hmm, the ones that could read. Let's see what the scriptures, the, what we would call the Old Testament, says about the Messiah. And they would begin to collect these lists, and there's many of them, um, a list of all the prophecies about the coming Messiah. Because, boy, if we ever needed someone to save us, we need them now. Rome is plowing our yard with salt and killing our goats and, you know, stealing our money and taking our 401K and turning off our Internet. We need help, right? And so they began to follow these lists. Well, of course, the list had almost all the same things on it. Some of them, people had a different eye and saw extra things that some of the others didn't see. But they collected these lists. Some of the major things that they noticed on these lists, which you can still see there in uh, Jewish writings and things like rabbinical writings, um, you can see, number one, the Messiah would come from Bethlehem. Problem, Jesus didn't brag on his birth certificate. Everybody knew him, Jesus of Nazareth. So a stumbling block to them. Second, he would descend from David, from the house of David. He would be a son of David. Well, because Bethlehem was the city of David the city of, of the lineage and of that birth. So again, they go, ah, well, that's not him. He's Joseph's son, you know, whatever. And uh, then they also, they began to say, well, the Messiah will perform, he will be like Moses in a lot of ways. Even the Bible calls him a prophet like unto Moses. And he will do specific miracles. He will feed his people. So really intriguing that Jesus would say, I'm the bread of life, and then he'd feed the 4,000 and the 5,000 with supernatural provision. He would bring freedom and all these sorts of amazing. And, you know, there's way more than I can get into. But another one of the things that's located there on these lists is that um, he would perform a specific kind of healing that had never taken place before in world history. In the Old Testament, people are healed of of barrenness, they're healed of leprosy, they're even raised from the dead, which is pretty good healing. Um, they're healed of snake bite numbers, that's the biggest one, you remember the serpent on the pole, the whole business. Um, they're healed of boils like Hezekiah, I mean, on and on, healed of all kinds of stuff. But have you ever noticed in the Old Testament, nobody is healed of being blind, being deaf, being lame, unable to walk, or being mute, unable to speak. But Jesus comes on the scene, and yeah, he cleanses the lepers, and, and he raises the dead, yeah, yeah. He does all that stuff, checks all the boxes, 
but he specializes in healings of the blind, deaf, lame, and mute. Very interesting. So with these lists, everybody's kind of knowing they're looking. These lists were written uh, probably two to 300 years before the time of Bartimaeus, widely publicized, talked about in the local synagogues. Hey, you'll know the Messiah because he's from Bethlehem. He descends from David. He heals the blind. Instead of saying blind, deaf, lame, and mute, it usually got summarized down to blind. But it, everybody knew that means all the other things, kind of short and abbreviated to that. Uh, you'll know him because of this. He'll teach about the kingdom of God with power and authority, and he'll, he'll restore the kingdom to Israel. They didn't understand it was going to take a couple thousand years for that to wrap up. But with all that in mind, look at this again. So when they, everyone is saying, hey, Jesus of Nazareth is nearby, what does Bartimaeus say? Jesus, I believe you're the Messiah. You check the boxes. You're the one. And what is he asking Jesus to do? Have mercy on him in what way? Look at the next slide, please. Um, be quiet. The people yell, put a cork in it, Bart. But he only shouts louder. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Really interesting. Verse 49, when Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up. They said he's calling you. You can almost kind of feel the crowd shift in Bart's favor there. Then the next one, Jesus asked the best questions. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, probably his most valuable possession in life. Threw aside his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. Here's this great question from Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? What a stellar question. That's like the ultimate customer service question, isn't it? Okay. You ever been in a place where the people that were there to take care of you didn't really care? You know, it's like, you want a Coke? Here's a Coke, you know, kind of a thing. And you know, what, what, do you, what do you want me to do for you? That's a fantastic question. How can I help you? What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked, my rabbi. Now, there's, the word rabbi is the, basically the Hebrew word for teacher. And so culturally, during this time, and there's a lot of data here in history, but, but during this time, the intertestamental period, there wasn't really universities or there wasn't colleges like we say. Um, education typically happened within the religious sphere. Uh, the large population, portion of the population was illiterate and couldn't read. If you could, you really had a leg up, and that typically took place through rabbinical training. What I mean by that is, if you were a sharp young person, the rabbi, the the, the teacher from the local congregation uh, was able to read and write. Uh, they could read from the scrolls. They were smart. They were educated. They, they lived in a position of kind of higher class and, and uh, affluence and education. And as it always is, education is always the way out of the poverty cycle globally and historically, right? And so because of their education, they would look and they would see in their small communities, they would find out who the best and brightest sharp young people were somewhere between 16 to early 20s. And they would see, ah, that person, they just kind of have stronger emotional intelligence. They kind of understand they're sharper, they're, you know, whatever, have different levels of character than the average. And the rabbi would go to that young person and the very common practice, they would say to that young person who they felt was sharp and had potential, follow me. The person, if they, and then the rabbi would turn away and walk away and walk kind of back to the synagogue, and if that young person would drop everything and follow the rabbi, then the rabbi would start this, this relationship with them, a mentoring relationship with a pool of people, um, the rabbi being the teacher, and the student, the word is disciple. You can think of anybody else that called disciples and they left everything and followed him, except the ones Jesus picked weren't sharp, right? I mean, there's a lot of like, if you understand the culture, there's a lot kind of really interesting stuff going on here, and it gives us all hope, doesn't it? So, but you would never, as a student or as a potential candidate, you would never go to the rabbi and say, I want to follow you. I want to be your student, because that would be considered culturally unacceptable and presumptuous. In America, we kind of are fueled on presumption, but a lot of other places around the world, presumption is very offensive. You know, I don't know about you, but if, you know, you folks are nice, but if you knocked on my door and I opened the door and you just kind of pushed me aside and went right into my kitchen and made a sandwich, I would think, where in the world are you from, you know? And that, that's kind of what this is like, saying, I want you to be my rabbi. I want to be your disciple. 
Then after a certain point, once the rabbi felt that he had imparted the life skills and typically reading and some other things to these young people, and they knew they were, he knew they were going to be leaders, then he would send them off as apostles. Now, we use that word in church, but that was the idea of now you're no longer a student. Now you've graduated, and we send you out to live your productive, fruitful life, right? So all this is going on aside from Jesus doing this. This is a real common practice during this time. And understanding some of this background, I'll hit this again if you would. So Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? Bartimaeus has already said, um, I believe you're the Messiah because you're the son of David. Even though everyone says, no, you're from Nazareth. He says, no, I think you're the Messiah. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. The man says, I want you to be my rabbi. And I want to see. This is really gutsy. Because he's someone of no social standing at all. Kind of gives us hope, doesn't it? He says, hey, I, nobody wants me. I don't even live in my father's house. I live in a relative's house at a position of a slave. My probably most valuable possession is my cloak, which I just left in the dust to find you. But I'm putting it all on you. You are the long-awaited Messiah. And I want to not only put my trust in you, but I want to study directly underneath you. And I want you to do the healing that only the Messiah can do. I want to, the, the healing that Moses couldn't do. I believe you can heal my eyes. This is a total declaration of faith in Jesus. That was astounding. And Jesus said to him, go for what? Your faith has healed you. Now, a lot of people get lost in the weeds on faith. And then some people teach, you know, faith is something. It's like this power like the force, and you can kind of harness it and whatever and all this. I don't go for that. Um, biblically, faith is the God-given ability to believe God. We need his help to believe him. And wherever you see in the Bible the source of faith revealed, it always comes from God's assistance. That's why it's okay to go, Lord, I kind of believe a little, but I, help me more. I believe, but help my unbelief. That made it in the Bible, by the way, and Jesus blessed that guy. And so when he says, your faith has healed you, a lot of people think, well, okay, so I've got poison ivy, so I need poison ivy healing faith. I've got the mange. I need mange faith. I've got heartworms. I need, you know, frontline faith. I need, uh, you know, whatever it is, whatever the injury is. And a lot of people get lost in the weeds. On, that's not how any of this works. What sort of faith was Jesus rewarding in Bartimaeus' life? Faith in what? What was the only type of faith at all that Bartimaeus was projecting? Jesus, the identity of Jesus. And I want to challenge you tonight. If you're here like, oh, Lord, I really need your healing touch. And, you know, oh, Jesus, my, my rabies are so bad I can hardly keep the foam down. And I just really need your help, you know, or if you're an old yeller fan, hydrophobia. I really, I really need help, you know, um, help me, Lord. Uh, but, Lord, I just, you know, I, if you, just keep your eyes on Jesus. It makes it so much easier rather than getting lost in the weeds. In fact, the Bible says in Christ is all we need for life and godliness. And I know really, really uh, well-meaning and even discipled Christians that when it comes to healing, they just take the longest, most circuitous road there. And you always end back at Jesus because like we are saying this morning, he's the center, you know. But, but why not just start there? That's what was rewarded in Bartimaeus' life. And so he says, go, your faith has healed you. Instantly, the man could see the miracle only the Messiah could do at that point. Of course, later on, the disciples and other Christians performed those healings. And what did he do? He followed his rabbi. Now, this little bit is not Bible, but it's good history. There's a lot of writings. They call them the apostolic fathers. It's, uh, oh, the first four or 500 years of, of church history. You Polycarp, Irenaeus, and some of these other characters like that. And, and it's good history. It's not Bible. There's no precious promises, but it's just kind of history. And it's interesting because um, John the Apostle, who was the pastor at Ephesus, and then later on after he did some prison ministry in, in uh, Patmos, he went back and he settled in Ephesus as an old man, and he mentored this dude, Polycarp. And in Polycarp's writings, Polycarp has a list of who the 70 were. Remember the 70 that Jesus anointed and sent out? 
And in Polycarp's list, Polycarp said, John told me Bartimaeus was one of the 70. Now, interesting. So he really did follow his rabbi, and then he was released in ministry. It's just kind of cool, you know. And all, in his list, there's others, uh, Mary Martha, Lazarus, um, some other names you might recognize. Joseph of Arimathea, who was also on the Sanhedrin and lent Jesus' his tomb there. Slightly used tomb for sale on Craigslist, you know. So it just kind of is interesting, interesting going on here. So now let's look at the James Scripture real quick. So check out James chapter 5. So this is the third of three scenarios James gives in James chapter 5. The first one, he says, is anybody happy? They should what? You remember? We didn't read it, but they should sing. They should sing songs. It's good to be happy, you know? Um, then the second scenario, this is an important one, is anyone troubled? How many know what it's like to get troubled? Well, these last couple of years have been really upsetting, and we've had a lot of loss, and a lot of family members die, and oh, good night. But, but, um, and it's troubling and upsetting circumstances and, you know, upside down. And it's not the first time there's been, you know, problems of financial problems and, and uh, you know, pandemics. And, you know, I mean, just maybe the first time in our lifetime. But is anybody troubled? They should press the caps lock key on their keyboard and do an angry rant on social media. <laughs> I got to tell you, and I don't... Uh, there's a lot of churches that have imploded during these times because the people didn't know James' second scenario. Is anyone troubled? They should complain. No. Is anyone troubled? They should lash out. Nope. Is anyone troubled? They should leave their church. No. Is anyone troubled? They should pray. Write that one down. How many know what it's like in a week's time to have some troubling things hit you? Our first response is not to lash out. Whenever you feel a disturbance in the force, just stop, drop, and pray for a minute. Right where you're at. Just, you're driving, you're at work. Just take, take a minute and a half. Jesus, this is troubling to me. Help me. It's amazing how the peace of God keeps your heart and mind safe in Christ Jesus, as the Bible said. Then here's third scenario. Is any of you sick? This word sick is a noun in the Greek. It's physically infirm. Something's wrong with your body, Right? Uh, or even mind, as we see in Revelation. What should you do? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you. Now, this word elders is really interesting. Um, there was a very popular English translation of the Bible that um, translated this word elder as the word deacon. The word deacon we find in the book of Acts chapter 6, and those are appointed ministry leaders. In the United States, often the way our church works, because it's a 501c3 charitable group, you have to have a board of directors. And so a lot of times, historically, churches kind of go, ah, oh, well, deacon, that's a board member or whatever. And we kind of have this weird blending. And most people don't even question it. But in, in the New Testament, deacons are ministry leaders. And then elder is the synonym for the word pastor. The word pastor, poemon, only occurs once in the New Testament. Um, in Ephesians chapter 4, everywhere else, it's this word elder, okay? So it has the idea, it kind of harkens back to the idea of like the village elders, the leaders, that kind of a thing. So the main meaning of this word elder is pastor. The secondary meaning is someone that's been around and has some miles on their tires. You've seen the faithfulness of God. How many have served the Lord for many decades You've probably forgotten more miracles than you can remember. If I were to give you a piece of paper and go write down all the miracles of your life, you're like, whoa, wait a minute, you know? I mean, you come up with a couple, and the more you'd think and chat with your spouse or whatever, you'd probably think of more. But you've, you've lived in his faithfulness. You've seen his goodness. That's the secondary meaning of this word elder, kind of the village elders kind of an idea. So interesting. Is any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church to come and pray over you, anointing you with oil. What kind of oil? Essential oils that I have for sale in the lobby. No, no, no. Um, no, what kind of, what kind of oil? Non-essential oil, right? Okay, so we're talking about like Crisco and WD-40. No, um, you know, the actual type of oil is irrelevant because it's symbolism. It's symbolism. And, and, uh, but the idea is, it, like in the Old Testament, they would anoint people for specific roles, prophets, priests, and kings. And it was the idea of there's a, a special moment that we're believing God is setting you apart and calling you to do something great, you know? And it's kind of a transition moment. It's a reflection moment. It's even a benediction moment where God 
blesses in that way. So the elders will come and pray over you, anointing you with oil. What? The name of the Lord. The focus, again, is always on Jesus. Such a prayer, prayer offered in faith, faith in what? The name of the Lord, the identity of Jesus, will what? Heal the sick. What an incredible promise from God. And the Lord will make you well. Again, it's the Lord. And if you've committed any sins, you'll be forgiven. This is a really cool, just a side note, but how many know what it's like to kind of feel guilt and condemnation in your life? It's a pretty common thing, and the enemy loves to do it. You might have asked God 800 times, Lord, forgive me for stealing that candy bar when I was in sixth grade or whatever it was, you know? And here you are, you're 170 years old, and now you've got prickly heat, and you're like, hmm, I wonder if the reason why I have prickly heat is because I stole that candy bar when I was in sixth grade. Come on, don't look at me like you haven't thought about this before. Maybe not this specific scenario. But it's a common thing to, from down here with limited information, to make big leaps of assumption. Look what Jesus does here. He goes, hey, let me put your troubled mind to rest. Let me give you an additional backstop here so you can know your sins are forgiven and so you're not jumping to condemning conclusions. I've heard people make these omniscient statements that only God could know. Oh, the reason why Aunt Betsy had cancer was because she must have had some sin in her life. How many know, stay away from people like that. They're actually ministers of condemnation, which is something Jesus never does. And so check this out. He gives you this backstop. By the way, if you've committed any sins, when you're receiving that prayer, extra backstop, they're going to be forgiven for sure. What a caring God. He cares about the torment even of our minds. And then the next one, um, confess your sins to each other. And may I just add my own commentary here? Don't confess your sins to a gossip. All right? You know, you, uh, be trustworthy in this stuff. Put stuff in the vault and, uh, and have good relationships. Everybody needs some good, trustworthy Christian relationships. If you don't have one, uh, talk to pastor. He can set you up with a group of small group of people. You probably have like a men's group. You probably got a ladies group. You probably got a poodles group, you know, whatever it is. Um, but it, just setting some things up and creating, getting some Christian friends. And if you're new here to Morency, you don't really have any relationship yet. Just come for about a month and all of a sudden you'll find you get adopted by accident and your people are taking you to lunch and inviting you over and your family and all of a sudden you realize man I got more friends and family than I knew I had here and and so just give it some time don't quit you confess and by the way if you're a, a been here done that person make sure you you keep your eyes out for people that are new and 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 minister the love of Jesus like was ministered to you because so often it's easy to just assume someone else will do that and uh, you know be a family so Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. Give me that scripture slide again, if you would. Um, I'm going to guess it's right up in here when it comes back on. Huh? Okay. Oh, oh, it's way off. Bummer. Okay. Um, confess your sins. That's why I'm not a surveyor. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may. That word may is really important. It's like saying, you want God to heal you? You have some responsibility in this. Follow biblical pathways to this because some people go well if god wants to heal me he'll just come and get me and people with that kind of an attitude receive bare minimums from the lord um, so that you maybe he'll give him the opportunity and then this great verse the earnest prayer earnest is uh, also synonyms for that word sincere heartfelt compassionate have you read the gospels where jesus was always moved with compassion on people they want you to be like Jesus here. Really care for the person you're praying for. The, the earnest prayer, sincere, heartfelt, compassionate prayer of a righteous person. Now, we stumble on that one because we go, oh, well, I mean, I know Jesus has forgiven me, but righteous, I mean, I don't even know. I mean, even the righteous brothers weren't that righteous, you know, and I don't know. I, boy, I don't know. And, but that word doesn't mean you're perfect. That word means you know where your cleansing and forgiveness comes from. Right? How many know who the Savior is who cleanses you from sin, right? Okay, so that's what that word is. The sincere prayer of a righteous person, a person who belongs to Jesus, and again, focus on Jesus, has what? Great power and produces wonderful results. Now, that word wonderful means nothing to us anymore. What a wonderful dessert. The idea of wonder is... Yeah, like the British way of saying it is gobsmacked, you know, like, wow, 
wah, speechless, wide-eyed, hair standing up on the arms. You're there when the tornado comes right past you and doesn't hit you, and you're just standing there speechless with you know, wishing you had bought Depends ahead of time. You know, you're going, wah. No, you know, I mean, or you hold your brand new baby in your arms and everything's happening. I mean, literally everything's lighting up in all of your life and you're filled with awe and wonder. These words have gotten so watered down for us. You can go down to, what's a grocery store called? Bashes. Yeah, you go down to Bashes and you're like, hmm, I'm hungry, but I don't want an ordinary meal. I'd like some bread. But I'm not wanting normal bread. I think uh, I'm, I'm ready. I'll put a crash helmet on and a seatbelt. I want wonder bread. <laughs> this bread is not like normal bread. This bread leaves you in a state of awe. And then on the way out, you go, you know what? I need to put something on that bread. But not any kind of mayonnaise is worthy of wonder bread. I'm going to slather a layer of miracle whip on wonder bread. You see how watered down those words are? Because, I mean, no offense, maybe you're like the wonder bread heiress here or whatever, but it's not like the best bread. And miracle whip, come on, you know, I'm, you know, it's just not, you know, anyway, so, but, but this, I mean, it's kind of the definition of overstatement, right? Um, but this word wonder fill, produces these, this kind of prayer has great power and produces wonderful, wonder-filled, awe-inspiring, speechless, gobsmacked, wide open, hair standing up on your arms results. Wow. And then we end in heaven, and we'll just look at this real quick. Uh, so this is in the book of Revelation. All theology ends in Revelation 21 and 22. We're in heaven with the Lord now looking ahead. And remember, um, the book of Revelation is an apocalyptic book, meaning it's revealing mysteries. And it's not revealing every secret. It's not, a lot of people get lost in the weeds on all this stuff. And they're like, oh, what about this and that? It's not designed to supply every answer. It's designed so when things happen, you go, oh, that's that one, right? So a lot of people think Revelation is like a code they have to crack. That's not the way this literature works. So we're now in heaven. And check out what happens. Um, am I in a cave all of a sudden? Is it just me? Okay, all right, so check it out. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. The word home in Greek is tabernacle. Harkens back to the dwelling place of God in the Old Testament. The tabernacle of God is now among men. In John chapter one, the word of God became flesh and tabernacled among them. So it's kind of a cool word play going on here. Now everybody can experience. Um, he will live with them. They will be his people. What happens up to this point in history? You get in the presence of God and you don't wear your safety apparatus. Uh, what happens? Your face melts. Well, you've seen Raiders of the Lost Ark. Your face turns to SpaghettiOs, right? And so, um, but now you can see him because we're in heaven with the Lord with glorified bodies. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, emotional pain, sorrow, grief, questions. You see the love of God in this? And there will be no more death, or sorrow, or crying, or pain, all these things at that point are now gone forever. Can you imagine? Because we live in a world that it's filled with disappointment and hurt, pain. None of us have ideal circumstances. I mean, you know, I look, you guys all look great. You look at me and think, oh, all right, you know, ugly, but whatever. And, um, but, I mean, you wouldn't know from looking at me that my grandfather killed my grandmother and beat my uncle with wrenches until he lived his whole adult life with a traumatic brain injury and I'd live in a group home for people with mental disabilities and my, my mother escaped at 12 years old as he was chasing her with a butcher knife. I mean, you know, and that's not an, an unknown story these days. And probably many of you have stories of abandonment and hurt and people that should have fulfilled a role of nurture in your life instead they fulfilled a dangerous or a, 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 a terrible role. And this is the normal human experience. But thank God, in the future, all of that's done away with. And he makes all of it right. We live in a world filled with injustice, where people judge others by the color of their skin or by the car they drive or by their social status or by their country of origin or something like that. But in heaven, it's every nation, every tribe, every kind of family together worshiping the Lord. 
So he makes everything right. And, and now as a church, we want to be an agent of God in the earth right now, don't we? We want to bring the kingdom of God as much as we can, but we know in the future is when everything's made right. So he wipes away all that emotional pain, sorrow. All these things are gone forever. Uh, then the next one real quick. Um, the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. The Lamb is, of course, Jesus. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life. When's the last time in the Bible you saw the tree of life? Garden of Eden, right? And the idea here, it, it's hard to know from, because it's kind of a little catch here in the Greek, but is it one tree that bridges over this river of life? Or is it one tree on either side? And people argue back and forth. But either way, it's the, the tree from the garden and that fruit that you couldn't partake of in the Garden of Eden or you would die is now there for us to partake of. And the leaves are for what? Go to the next one, please. The leaves of the tree are for to make medicine for the nations. It's not like literally we're going to take the willow bark and make aspirin for everybody. But the idea is what was once forbidden is now bringing healing to everyone because now in God's timing, everything's right. And the word nations is people groups. The worst atrocities in human history have happened because people don't like people that aren't like themselves. And I just love the way God does that. Now, no longer will there be a curse upon anything. How many remember the curse from Genesis 3 that brought us trouble? For the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there, and his servants will worship him, and they will see his face. Wow. So with all that in mind, every message needs points. So here's five points in four minutes. You ready? Okay, let's look at the five basic avenues to receive healing. I want you to see how generous God is. Here we go. These are fast. Number one, personal prayer. How many of you are a person? How many of you can pray? This is when you pray for yourself. Did you know that you can pray for yourself and there's nothing wrong with that? I've had people, they get in an all condemnation. Oh, I, don't, I should pray for other people, not myself. If you didn't pray for yourself, you couldn't be saved. In fact, I mean, don't neglect praying for other people, but we all should pray more for ourselves. God, help me to be more like you and less like me and all these things. Can you think of an example in the Bible of someone who called to Jesus on his own, heal me? Bartimaeus. How's that for an example? And there's others, but personal prayer. Then number two, someone with a special gift. We find this in 1 Corinthians 12 and then mentioned again in chapter 14, that God can indeed in an extra way gift someone to really be used of healing. And the cool nuance of this is that um, uh, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, this idea, is it really echoey or is it just me? Is, that, is there a way to kill that? Or is it, I mean, I'm do, doing something here. This happened all of a sudden. It's probably awesome. There we go. Oh, there we go. All right, sorry. Um, I know I was messing with the switch or something. I don't know if I messed something up. But um, so this idea that uh, someone could have a special gift, the idea is not like, well, we venerate them and they come in. You know, the rest of us come to church at 1040, but they come at 1045 being carried in on a sequin litter to the front or whatever. It's not like that. The idea of Paul's teaching is that in every church, there will be people gifted in different ways to supply this. And I want to ask you, Morency First Assembly, have you yet discovered those that are gifted in a special gift of healing in your church? Because if you haven't, man, you got to, it's like finding the copper in the ground. You've got to dig and find these things. And that doesn't mean that that person, everybody they touch is healed and there's some special person. Honestly, a lot of times it's kooky people. Have you ever noticed that a lot of times people that operate in the power of God are a little out there? Right? It's not an excuse. We should all grow and mature. But a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, this person, they are, you know, they are pedigree. They should be the one. We don't get to pick who that is. It's just the people that God uses. And, and uh, so that's an interesting. And then number three, um, 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 is a reference for that. Elders or leaders. That's James 5. So elders meaning pastors or the idea of a person. Like I would say a senior citizen that served the Lord for many decades this is you. Our culture says, the older you get, the more you just need to mind your business, sit on your rocking chair, and fade out eating a can of cream corn, you know? But that's unrighteous. That's a Western world fallacy. You go to, you go to Eastern world my, mentality places, and they honor their elders, and that's biblical and righteous. 
And so you think about it. You serve the Lord for 40, 50 years. You've seen God's hand at work, and you just trust him a whole lot more than you did before. You've seen God walk you by hand through crises and through death and through disruption. And you have a taproot that a new Christian hasn't yet developed because they haven't had the chance yet. And this is saying not just pastors. This is saying that elders, that, that community of, you know, the village elders kind of an idea, the, the village elders within your church, the people have been around a long time. I know I talked with, with one brother, and I don't know if I see you here tonight, but I talked with one brother that, um, that he said he was actually involved in the physical construction of this building, and he used to go to the old church way down in, you know, wherever it was, it got taken away in the flood or whatever, and it, you, you see the hand of God in these ways. Oh, there you are, right there. I'm seeing it right here in front of me. I mean, you think about that, a lot of people go, well, yeah, but that's just brother so-and-so. But he's walked with the Lord, and his wife has walked with the Lord for decades. And even as a young person going, maybe you don't know me very well, and you say, hey, would you pray for me? That's a very powerful thing to take place. And again, in our culture, we say, ah, oh, you know, the more the shingles turn white, and sometimes the shingles fall off the roof, you know, but the more the, more the hair grays and whatever, and some mysteriously turns blue, uh, but uh, but the more the more the more the hair turns white, the less voltage they have. That's not the way the kingdom of God works. You know God more than you've ever known Him, right? You've got extra power. Don't listen to the world. Listen to the Bible. I'm telling you, seniors, if you lay hands and pray for some people, you'd see some dramatic healings take place. Even you got people go, well, I'm not healed myself. That's never a requirement. Only Jesus has perfect everything. The rest of us operate out of brokenness, right? Okay, then number five, uh, or for any believer, not any believer, but any believer, right? Okay, so this is important. This is James 5. Again, therefore, pray one for another. Now James turns his attention from the elders and leaders praying for healing, but he goes, now all of you can pray for each other. Now, stop and think. Look at this room. We got folks, every age group, all kinds of backgrounds here. How many have given your life to Jesus? Give me a wave. Yeah, okay. You can pray for the sick. But we typically go, well, I don't know what I'm doing. But that's why you're asking the one who does to come and do it, right? You're simply inviting Jesus. Any believer can pray for the sick. What are the qualifications? You're really compassionate and caring towards the person. And you know where your righteousness comes from. You're focused on Jesus. So this is kind of the way this works. A lot of people go, well, what's the language? What should I say? So people, sometimes they get super medical. They watch like too much medical TV, you know. Uh, well, I see that lump. Do I need to call Dr. Pimple Popper? What, what should I do, you know, and, and all that for deliverance? Ooh, yuck. And, uh, man, you'll never eat an eclair after that show. And so um, I... I just, oh, I wish I wouldn't have said that now. But anyway, um, a, a lot of people, they, they think like you have to get more information so you can know more, so you can help the person. But remember, your help in praying for healing it doesn't come from your own reservoir. Your main job when you pray for someone is to care for them so that that person feels the love of God just slathered all over them. And then that you're reaching up to Jesus in that moment. And all of a sudden, you become a pipeline, a conduit. You're reaching out of love to the person. You're reaching up to Jesus. The power of God just kind of flows naturally through you. Not because of anything you're doing. It's not, well, I'm wearing my mother of pearl cross from Jerusalem. Well, I've got my head wrapped in a foil cone on the high point of the city during a lightning storm. You know, kind of a thing. Don't do that. But it's, it's, it's uh, you have to always put disclaimers on everything. But... Um, it, a lot of people think it's you got to, you know, you have to have your special, you know, wear your special socks and whatever it is. And it's just not that way at all. In fact, this may surprise you. Uh, it doesn't surprise me after being around Jesus for a while. But um, there have been many times when people have asked me to pray for them. And I don't possess any special healing gift. I just operate out of that. Any believer can pray. And we see people healed all the time. Um, I, I actually have a few friends that operate in a really high level, like crazy healing gift. I have one friend that has a real special gift of faith for healing of the blind. And he literally, will, he'll line up, he's in Africa right now, but he'll line up and he'll put advertisements in town. Every blind person come and see the glory of God. And he starts out before he ever does anything. If you're blind, come up here. And he'll just lay his hands and praise him one after another after another. 
also a special gift of faith for the deaf. Matter of fact, he was at my brother-in-law's church in PA two years ago, and they had 17 people born deaf, both ears healed. Wow. I mean, and he's, you know, he's not a big shot or anything. He'd never heard of his name, but he just really used in healing. That's not me. I pray for people out of general faith. Lord, you said to, I'm a believer, not a believer. And so I'm going to, you know, pray for that person. And, um, and it's interesting. The main thing that we're typically concerned, we kind of get performance anxiety. Like, what am I supposed to say? What am I, you know, because we're so like, we're kind of afraid of performance. Like we kind of think maybe Simon Cowell is going to judge our prayer. But that's not the concern. When you pray for someone, please don't be concerned. You, you can, this may surprise you, but I have many times misunderstood the person that I was praying for. And I said, how can I pray for you? And they told me one thing. I can't think of an example now. But they tell me one thing, and I misunderstood them. And I prayed for them to be healed of something they didn't have. But Jesus healed them of the right thing anyway. Does that really surprise anybody, though? You know, it's like we're used to, well, certain things have to happen in process. This is not algebra. This is not trig, okay? This is relationship. Father who knows what we have need of even before we ask, but told us to ask anyway, right? And so this is really your main concern when you pray for In a moment, when we pray for each other, your main concern is reaching up to God with all of your heart. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Your main job is to slather the love of Jesus on that person care for them. You're not the magic words. There's nothing like that. That's sorcery, by the way. If you rely on an incantation for a supernatural result, that's not the relationship we have with God. So your main, main here's like an example as we go to prayer here. You know, if I'm, if I'm praying for pastor, you know, you know, I'd say, oh God, you know, our pastor, how can I pray for you? And he goes, okay, I've got, um, I don't know, something terrible, really awful, itchy, he has poison ivy on his uvula. That's bad because every time you go to scrub, you know, it's really bad. Bad can talk about chain reactions, right? And so we're, we're praying for him. And, and so if I go, oh, Lord, you know, just come now and surround his uvula with your glory. And, go, you know, all this kind of, who cares? But if I go, Jesus, and, and I start really caring for pastor as I pray for him. And I'm really more concerned. I, and I get it slowed down. Usually whenever we're uncomfortable, we hurry up to get it over with. That's the quickest way to miss a healing anointing. Slow down. Stuff from God takes time. And just slow. Not that you have to take 20 hours. But whereas you normally might take 15 seconds to pray so you can get out of there as quick as you can. Slow down. So allow yourself to feel uncomfortable. Because listen, the supernatural is always uncomfortable at some level. So, oh God, you know, just touch pastor. Lord, while I'm here, I just pray, God, you bless his family, you bless his marriage, you bless his kids, and, you know, and you just slow down and just kind of walk around that person's life and anything you can think of. Pray for God's blessing or help or restoration. Lord, if there's any, you know, I don't know, any family stuff that, you know, outside extended family that they could really be using as an agent of healing and just minister, give them grace there, give them wisdom in their job. And you just slow down a little bit. Instead of it being 15 seconds, it might be 45 seconds or a minute. But you slow down. Your main job when you walk away is not that the person is healed because that can only come from God. But your main job is that you have expressed the love of God and care of God for that person. And I found when you approach healing prayer and that way it takes the pressure off of you People feel the love of God, and they end up getting healed a lot more than you expect. A lot of that has to do with slow down, you know. So I want to ask you to do something with me. Stand with me to your feet. Reach for the sky. Reach up as high as you can. Stretch. All right. Now, if you didn't put your deodorant on, keep your arms down because it lets the dogs out like that old hymn says. All right. Now, Take a moment, stretch yourself out, do a little hokey pokey, whatever you need to do, all right? You've been sitting there for a while. It's been a long day. You just think if you, how many have been here all three services this weekend, okay? It's like extra credit with Jesus. I believe, and I'm not sure, it's probably not a prophetic word, but I believe you have moved from living in heaven in a golden van down by the river to a single semi-detached, all right? So that, that has uh, taken place. But... Um, I want to ask you to do something with me. Here it is. I want to ask you, if you would, in a moment, if you feel comfortable in lifting your hands to the Lord 
And but this, when you do it, like sometimes we go like, I want you to do a little little different posture. I want to ask you if you turn your palms towards you and lift them up to God, like He was handing you something and you're catching something He's handing to you. And I want you to look at your uplifted hands, because that's your posture administering healing. You're reaching up and saying, Lord, what do you have? What will you do? Can I be used by you to to deliver the package you put in my hand to the right person? And now, now would you pray your own prayer and ask God to use you in healing? Come on, Lord, I just give these hands to you. I know there's nothing supernatural about my hands. But Lord, as I reach to you and pray, I know I'm going to feel helpless and a little awkward. But I pray that you would use those moments to show your healing power and grace to people. Lord, I'm not concerned about marketing and what people think. I don't want to be wonder bread or miracle whip. That's an overstatement. I want to see people really touched by your true, awe-inspiring, life-changing power. And I don't know how that works, but you do. I want to partner with you, son of David. Come and do your miraculous work. Would you ask Jesus to use your hands for healing right now? Lord, use my hands. I pray that even some would right now begin to feel power from heaven beginning to manifest upon their hands. Thank you for it, Lord. Grace and strength. Oh, Jesus, send an outpouring of healing from this church that touches Lorenzi and the communities around. Thank you for it, Jesus. Thank you for it, Lord. God, help us to get over ourselves and our fears and our performance anxieties and instead just really be concerned about reaching out to you and reaching out in love to others. And I pray, Lord, in just a moment as we lay hands on one another just on a shoulder in prayer, that your true power would come. And tonight in this room, you would perform life-altering healings like I don't need to go for dialysis anymore healings. I mean life changers. Thank you for it, Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, Here's what's going to happen. And you can keep your hands up unless they go numb. You can put them down. Whatever you like to do. This is not a prison. If you want to, you know, do whatever you want to do. But um, if you're having a moment, you can just stay in that. But in a moment, I'm going to invite anyone that wants to experience baptism in the Spirit, either you've not yet prayed for it or you're somewhere on that journey, but the confirming sign of that supernatural language hasn't come for you. I'm going to invite you to come forward in just a moment. Now, if you're a person, you go, hey, I need a healing and I want to be baptized in the Spirit, then come up to receive baptism in the Spirit. God often supersizes those orders, all right? Um, But the rest of us, we're just going to assume that we all need healing on some level. You go, well, I have as a birthmark or whatever. That's fine, you know. Um, And we're just going to give God that opportunity. Or you could stand in for a loved one that needs healing. But listen to these instructions real quick. For those that remain in their seats, I'm going to ask you in just a moment, not yet, but in just a moment, to get in groups of three or four. Everybody say three or four, okay? Now, if you're new here, this is a great moment to meet some people, all right? And, and don't feel awkward. Ever. These are lo- awesome people here. Um, get in a group of three or four. Please don't get in groups of two or five or six because you won't end at the right time, and it will be the wrong dynamic, okay? So just try. If you get in a group and there's five, vote somebody off your island, all right? And if we need to have something for math's sake to work out, it's okay if we have, a, you know, one, one rule breaker. But um, so listen, when you get in that group, don't hold hands. You can get in a circle. You can step in the aisle. You can sit down. You can whatever. That's, just be comfortable. But your job is to just pick someone first out of your group of three or four and go, oh, what's your name? Mary. Okay, Mary, how can we pray for you? And then Mary will just mention a few things. Don't tell big stories or histories. Just take the label. Um, my back hurts, my foot stinks, and I hate my mother-in-law. Whatever your need is, are, okay? If you've come tonight into this room and you're not sure that you belong to God and you want to be, you can tell that group, hey, I, you know, I've got my ankle hurts and, and I want to make sure that I belong to God or I want to get saved. And every group in this room will be able to pray with people so that they can experience the biggest miracle of all, the miracle of salvation. And as greedy as I am, I love to lead people to Jesus. I'm going to share that joy with you tonight. Oh, I hate that, but it, it's the right thing to do. And, uh, and I want to give you that opportunity to lead people to the Lord. So, so you're going to get in a group. You'll pick someone to go first. You'll just hear a couple of their needs. Some of you, or you're such a wreck, you're like, I need it head to toe, stem to stern, you know, whatever. I need an overhaul. That's fine. But you're, what you're doing is you're just giving the other people something to start talking about in prayer. 
Okay? So after they hear your quick need, everyone in your group, if, you, if you're okay with it, they'll just lay a hand on your shoulder. If for whatever reason you're concerned about, you know, you're at risk physically and you're just like, I, I don't want people touching me, that's cool. We're all grown up. We can handle If you just go put your hands up and go, hey, can you just stretch your hands towards me? Nobody's going to be offended. We love each other. Nobody's allowed to be offended. If you're offended, you're a knucklehead. Don't be one, okay? And so that gives you another reason to be offended. But just stretch your hand towards that person. And then the other two or three people in the group, if you can lay hands on their shoulder, great. If not, stretch a hand. Your job is to, on top of each other, out loud, slather prayer on them. Oh, God, just heal Mary or touch her body, help her ankle, help her, you know, help her dachshund, whatever her problem is. And, you know, Lord, bless her in this way, bless her in that. Your job is not to have the, the bold person pray and the meek people go, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Your job is to be three firemen with fire hoses of the love of God, and you're just hosing that person down. Slow down. It would be very common that during that time, something will bubble up inside. Like you just feel like you need to pray for, I don't know, Mary's finances. Oh, God bless her finances. God does things like that all the time. Just follow them and just pray for those things. And then you'll find, um, pray a little longer than you feel comfortable, like, but not too long. You know, like, I don't know, 45 seconds a minute, don't time yourselves. But just, you know, allow yourself to feel a little helpless because that's when you really start drawing and depending on the Lord. And it's a safe room. This is all gimme putts here tonight, right? And so then when you're done, you'll feel the, the group will calm down. And then the next person, okay, George, how can we pray for you? Brother George Blackbeard, how can we pray for you? Well, I see you've got a patch. You've got a peg leg. You've got a hook. Wait a minute. Am I getting a word of knowledge? Do I perceive you have scurvy? I don't know if that's the Lord or just assumption. But you're just going to take time hearing one person's need and everybody praying for it. And then just go to the next one. And listen, tonight, if, if you've got deep emotional hurt and pain or grief going on, um, you could just simply say, don't, don't go into big story, but instead just say, hey, you know, I just need healing inside or, you know, I'm battling with grief or, or bitterness or unforgiveness. And I'm going to tell you, that's the kind of stuff, you read that revelation stuff, that's the kind of thing Jesus specializes in. Why carry that load anymore? He's not going to wipe your memory tapes, but he'll pour healing bomb. will take the stinger out so it can start healing. And really minister grace to you. Jesus, use your people tonight for your glory. Amen. Would you hit that altar music for me? And so if you want to receive spirit baptism, come on up front to the, real quick. And if I can get the pastors and their spouses to help me, come on up front. Come on, come on, come on. Don't wait on anybody else. Sneak on up. Okay. Otherwise, would you begin to get in groups of three or four? Just spin around in a group. Just quickly get in a group. Yeah. Beautiful. For those wanting spirit baptism, if you just come right here to the middle real quick, I'm going to give you some instructions off mic so I don't disturb. So if you're in a group, get in a group of three or four. You're going to pick one person at a time. Hear their need. Everybody pray for that one, and then you'll move to the next one, okay? Awesome.
Thank you. 